Amen. Y'all doing okay tonight? Praise God. We're going to get into the word. Amen. I just have two, uh, two verses that I was going to read um, out of Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read Romans 7 verses 5 and 6. I was in the ESV version. Uh, while she's getting everything set up, I guess I would say that just to kind of remind you in case you didn't know. Um, that Romans 7 is, Paul is looking, he's reflecting backwards on a time in his life when he did not really understand. This is my understanding of the book of, of Romans chapter 7. Uh, as I've, This has probably been my favorite book to study. I've preached out of it more than any other book um, since I've been a preacher. But what I just want you to understand is, is that my understanding of Romans 7 is that the Apostle Paul, again, is reflecting backwards to a time when he was struggling as a believer. After his conversion, some, some teachers would take issue with that and that they would say that this is actually before when he was a young man, before he was converted. Um, I can't really get into all the details that I think are internal in chapter 7 that disprove that. Um, for instance, I will say this one. He said, the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. That's in Romans 7. That word revived is only used twice in the New Testament, and it's used both in the book of Romans. The other time, it's, I believe it's chapter 14, and it's speaking of Jesus, and that he had died, but that he came back to life. And that's the very meaning of the word itself. It means to, it's describing something that was dead, but then came alive. And we understand from the overall teaching of the Word of God that a person is born with sin alive in them, right? Through the sinful nature. So there's no way that sin could have been dead and then revived uh, until after his conversion. That's just one piece of evidence that shows that. Um, but what I want, uh, real quick, before we read verses 5 and 6, the first four verses of chapter 7, and I taught on this a while back, if you'll remember, it talked about marriage, right? It talked about the fact that um, that a woman, as long as she's married to her husband, and many people have thought that this was a teaching on divorce. I used to think that that's not really what's being taught here. Um, it's talking about using human marriage as an analogy to the relationship between the believer and the law, okay? He says that as long as a woman is married to her, her husband, as long as her husband lives, that um, that she's that she's according to the law, she's married to her husband. And if she has a re married to another man, then she would be considered an adulteress. But that if her husband died, she would be free from that marriage, right, to marry another. And then in the last part of verse four, he says, like basically, he just says, "That's us," because. In Christ, we died to the relationship that we have with the law. Now we're able to be married to Christ and we can bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Okay, so that was the first four verses. And so we'll read verses five and six. So he says for in verse five, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code, which is another way to say the written law. OK. And so whenever we understand that the Apostle Paul is showing us and, and, and explaining to us or, or he's taking the position, listen, before I knew Christ, I had so, before after I knew Christ, but before I understood how to walk in grace. That's what I wanted to say. After I came after I was converted, but, but before I really understood what it meant to walk in grace. I found myself in a spiritual place where I slipped back under law 
because I didn't realize that that was a problem. Now, you got to understand that for the apostle Paul, that's really all he knew his whole life. I mean, he was born a Jew. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He explains all this to us in other letters. And, and so all he knew was the law. You and I really didn't know Jewish law till we got saved and we began to study some of the Old Testament. Uh, but, but, what he, but that was all he knew. And so, and without even realizing it many times, this is, this is one part of the law that I think I really want you to understand because I'll lose you with all this terminology if, if I don't make a point. That, and, and we said it a while back. Look, before we get into, look, go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. I, and the last time I taught on this, I used this verse. But let's just go ahead and go there now. Galatians 3, 10. And it says, it says, the righteous. Isn't we there? I'm there. But... Okay, I might be. Uh, okay. You in the ESV? Yes. Okay. Well, I might, I might have missed the verse. Let's read it off here. <laughs> for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. This is really what I wanted you to see the last phrase right here. And do them. And so the law, again, was all about doing, right? It, about actions and about doing, whereas New Testament faith is all about believing. Yeah. Believing specifically that Christ has done what, what had to be done. That he, that he was born of the, of the flesh, meaning in his physical body, without sin. And that he was able to fulfill the law and that he was able to die in our place. And he took upon him the curse of the law. For the, for the word the law says that cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Right. And so Jesus became a curse for us. But what I wanted you to see here is that the main essence of the law is to do it. Right. And so without us even realizing it for you and I that are Gentiles, I think that it's important that I try to make a connection because we're not Jews like Paul was. But the essence of the law and the problem that we run into is that we start to look at performance. We start to look at the doing of Christianity and we and without realizing it is that we put our faith in what we think we're supposed to do. And we put our we put our, our trust in what we do instead of staying focused on what he did. Does that make sense? What I mean by that is this, is that when, and I used to say this kind of stuff a lot, but now I want to be careful in the way that I say it. You're never going to learn about Jesus unless you read the word of God. You really can't learn the heart of the father to you to you introduce yourself to Jesus. And yes, the introduction is all about accepting him into your heart. But until you get into the word and you really learn his character and you understand his words and you start to listen to what he has to say. And the more you familiarize yourself with the words that he spoke, the more you start to really get an essence of what he really felt, what he really thought. You know, and, and then now when we see him because he's the express image of the father we are now gaining access to understanding the father's heart does that does that make sense so you're never going to really know jesus unless you get into the word i just got to tell you that it's not going to listen there's nothing wrong with watching your favorite preachers on youtube i do it i watch a lot of preachers there, there's nothing as long as you're not getting into something that's not good for you there's nothing wrong with watching good preachers on youtube there's nothing wrong with reading commentaries there's nothing wrong with listening to other men of god preach or there's nothing wrong with listening to you know your pastor preach all that's good but but the whole counsel of god's word is is his way to communicate his heart to us and it's a lifelong endeavor to understand God's heart. You're not going to learn it overnight. You're not going to learn if you read through the Bible in one year. You're not. It's, it's a good start, but it's just a start. And it's just the very beginning. And you're just barely scratching the surface. Amen. And, and so I just want to encourage you to understand that. With that said, something weird can happen with reading the word about it. We can turn it into a performance basis of something and it was never meant to be that. And we can turn that into what we think is our righteousness. Like, in other words, I don't feel like I'm right with God. And we look at what we don't do and we think, man, I got to get back into the word, right? You should be in the word, but that's not what makes you righteous. Jesus makes you righteous. 
You've been clothed in his righteousness. When he died on the cross for you, he paid the penalty for you. And the exchange took place and he gave you the gift of his righteousness. And he took your guilt upon him. Amen. Same thing with prayer. You get the point. Right? How do we really know the heart without the word and without true prayer and intimacy and spending time in the presence of the Lord? I'm just I'm just going to be real with you. I think it's very difficult that we can grab a hold of the Father's heart. I think it's very difficult that we can learn what His voice sounds like unless we spend time in, with Him in His presence. Okay, and so as we do those things, we begin to hear His heart. We begin to hear His voice. We become more tuned in to when He's speaking. Amen. But we can do the same thing with prayer that we can do with reading the Bible. And we can do the same thing with coming to church that we do with that. We can do the same thing with getting into ministries and, and our gift that God has given us to give back. And all of those things are beautiful. We can't really, we're, we're supposed to be engaged in all of that. But if we're not careful, we'll take our eyes off of his performance in doing. And we'll put them on our performance in doing. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you happened to the Apostle Paul. He said, I was alive once without the law, but then the commandment came. Now, I used to like the way Brother Larson used to say it a long, long time ago. He used to say, it doesn't tell us what the commandment was. It, it could have been, I, 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 I realized that if now I gave my life to Christ, but if I don't eat a pork chop, I'll be even more holy. It probably wasn't that, but whatever it was, he added to and it caused a conflict in his spiritual condition. And the reason that I even bring all this up, not only is it very important in the word of God, but many times believers don't understand why they're struggling. They don't understand why they're struggling in their faith and, 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 and why they, why they, you know, internally these things that are going on that they know that they're fighting with and they, and they don't understand why it is that these things are happening and they get frustrated in their walk and and I have to tell you that many times it's because they're still living under a performance based Christianity there's some type of a form of law they're looking at themselves comparing themselves to other people not comparing themselves to the Lord they're not really allowing the Lord to speak to them and then to allow and when he reveals to them the things that are in them to bring them to the foot of the cross and to allow them to be crucified so that he now can produce the fruit of righteousness on the inside of us. That's the plan of God. He wants to crucify our flesh. He wants to get rid of those things in our life that are, that are contrary to the word of God and the will of God. He wants to replace them with the fruit of the spirit. Amen. Amen. So, so there were four things that were mentioned in that first verse of scripture. Can you put verse five back up there for me just so that we can have it up there? Uh, yes, ma'am. Romans 7, 5. It says, for while we were living in the flesh, and that's the first thing I wanted you to see, flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members. Now, <laughs> I know I've done a lot of teaching on this little graphic here, but I'll be honest with you. I think that this, the reason I keep doing it is because I think this is very, very important. And this is one of the reasons that people are struggling because they don't really understand themselves. They don't understand really the own condition of their own hearts. And they don't understand the conflict that's going on on the inside of them. And I feel like it's important that we do understand that. So do you remember I call this psychology, not psychology, right? And so what we got to understand is that we're made up of three parts, right? And, and, and the soul is made up of three parts. And so this is our outer man, which is our flesh, right? And the word flesh is used in a lot of different ways. And we're going to kind of look at that in just a second. The word flesh can mean physical body, which just means your physical body. You are a physical creation. But there's a spiritual connection to the flesh. Right. There's a, there, the, fle the word flesh is also used. Matter of fact, the NIV translators chose to use the word sinful nature in Galatians chapter 5 for the word flesh. It's not the word that's typically translated as sin. The word sin is typically hamartia, and the word flesh is sarx. But where sarx was in Galatians 5, the NIV translators chose to use the word sinful nature. Because, see, when we're talking about the flesh in a spiritual sense, there is also the tainting of the flesh with sin. And so what it's talking about is that it's not just an inanimate. And I've tried to have this conversation with, with people before, and I've even tried to say it to you guys before. But the flesh by itself 
is inanimate. In other words, it's not alive, right? There has to be spiritual life of some sort that causes it to move, right? And, and so if it's the Holy Spirit, amen, that's in us and he's moving us in the right direction, right? And it's other spirits that want to entice us to move in another direction. But our flesh, and, that, and that's one thing that I do want to say, this has kind of been on my heart too, because we have... We have probably like a, a, some differing opinions about demonic spirits and about and about d different things like that. And I kind of mentioned it in my notes. I wasn't going to get into it too much, but I just want to say I think it's important for us to talk about this a little bit, just because it's out there in the church world. The, the, there's a big, big thing that's happening, and it's called Deliverance Ministry, and it's and it's becoming a really, really big thing. Now, with that said, I want to say this. We may not completely agree. There may be somebody on this side of the room you believe a certain thing about demon spirits and believers. Nobody has a problem with believing that demon spirits can affect unbelievers. I mean, that's really what we're seeing in the in the book of Acts. That's really what we're seeing in the gospel. Jesus is casting out devils in people that have not been saved. Okay, and in reality, there's there's not even really an instance in that I have found. I'm not trying to act like I'm the world's authority on this, but I'm just trying to make this point. Not even in the book of Acts, other than the Acts chapter 8, where Philip goes to Samaria and he does ministry that I can see believers. You can talk about Jews all day long. Jews are not believers. Jews are not born-again Christians. They don't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. And, and it says that Philip preached the gospel, people were getting saved, and he was casting out devils. But it doesn't tell us he cast out devils after they got saved. So I'm just trying to say what the Word of God says. That's all I'm trying to do here. I personally have come to the conclusion that I do believe that it is possible for a believer to be, in a sense, demonized. Now, what does that even mean? I believe, now, listen, I'm, but I want to make this very clear. I do not believe that's normal Christianity. And I'm going to make a point here in a second. And I'm going to say this too. We got people that are sitting in churches all over the place that, that possibly were never even truly converted. Okay. And we're not of the persuasion in a house like this, at least I don't think, that we don't believe that it's not possible that a believer could lose their salvation. Now, we don't know when that happens. But, but I believe that it is possible for people to open up the door to sin and not even realize it, changing the object of their faith or whatever the case. And before you know it, they're not even really in the faith anymore. And they wouldn't have known they weren't in the faith because we know in the story when Jesus talks to him and he says, they, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, on that day. And I will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And, and, and somebody made the comment to me. Yeah, but it says that he, the Lord said he never knew them. And I made this point the other day, but they sure thought they knew him. So you're not the Holy Spirit to decide who's in, who's out. I'm not the Holy Spirit to decide who's in, who's out. I'm just making a, I'm just trying to make a simple observation. That I believe that if a person, the two scriptures that I believe we have in the New Testament and the apostolic letters, I'm talking about the letters to describe the possibility of this. Why are you talking about that? Because this is after the church is established. This is after the church is established. This is after the cross. This is after the ascension. This is after Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne. This is after the day of Pentecost. This is after believers are now have the ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. And the letters are being written to the church to explain to them what Christianity is supposed to look like. And now I had a good conversation with somebody one time who said, well, they didn't believe, they believed that there wasn't a lot of talk about it because it was common knowledge and it was just happening. That's a good point to make. But at the same time, all of the apostolic letters are most of the time directly related to troubles in the church and the apostles are correcting the troubles and they're not talking about casting devils out of people. They're talking about flesh. They're talking about people's flesh that needs to be crucified. They're talking about how we need to die to self. They're talking about how we need to come to grips with the reality of the word of God and that we need to do business with the Lord. Now, if a person refuses to do business with that, the scripture says, don't open the door. Amen? Amen. Don't open the door. So when we do open the door, it says, don't give place to the devil. 
So when we do open up doors and we get place and we don't repent and we keep playing around with the devil, who knows what can happen? So I do believe that when it does happen, it's not in your spirit. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. That's impossible because, see, the Holy Spirit possesses your spirit. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit, now he owns you, amen, because Jesus bought you. And that's a good. That's another thing that's important for you and I to understand. Jesus purchased us with his blood. So what I personally believe is that if a demon does demonize a Christian, it's in their, it's in their soulish part. Because, see, if a spirit wants to control a person's flesh and wants to make their members do something, it's going to tell their mind. I've already explained all these things to y'all before, but the more we talk about these things, the more we might be able to understand. And again, I'm not asking you to agree with me on this. I don't even, look, I'm just telling you what I, what, what I think, okay? And, this, and, 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 you know, and I'm not going to get into it because I'm not really doing the teaching on that. But, but what I do want you to know is this, is that, the scripture says, and you can put 1 Corinthians 6, 17 up there. We've talked about this scripture a lot, but it says it. Now, what he's saying is, in this particular passage of scripture, the context is actually where he says that, you, that a man can become one flesh with a harlot. And he goes on to say this. He says that the body is not for fornication. The body is for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. And you remember we've been preaching on that lately where it says a body you have prepared for me. Yes. Part one was Jesus. Part two was you and I. And so this is another re revelation about that where it says the, the body is not for fornication. The body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. The Lord is looking for a body that he can inhabit yes. to where he can do the work of the kingdom upon the earth. Amen. Amen. But what he's saying is this, is that he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And so, so whenever you do truly get born again, and Ephesians 1.13 teaches that the spirit of God comes on the inside of you, that you become one in your spirit with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there's other scriptures. John chapter 14 talks about that, that, you know, he, the spirit of truth, He's been with you and he will be in you talking about after the cross, the Holy Spirit would come to live on the inside of people. Ephesians 1 13 teaches that you heard the preaching of the gospel and you believe that you received the down payment of, and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And so we're seeing that we become one, one spirit with the Lord. And so this really, I would say, is where is where the new man in his perfection dwells, if, if that's okay. Like you're, you're perfectly saved in your spirit. The scripture even says that you already have the mind of Christ. Doesn't it say that? We, it says it. I think it's at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But we have the mind of Christ. But if we're honest with one another, there's many times that we might not be operating in the mind of Christ, Right? That's why the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4 that you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so that's where we get to the soulish part of the man. Because the soul, according to the definition in the Greek language, is that it's made up of the mind, what I think, the will, what I want, and the emotions, what I feel. And there's many times that what the human creature that is now born again, the new creation, what he's thinking is contrary to what the Word of God says. Many times what he wants for his own life is contrary to the will of God for his life. Right? I mean, there's all kinds of examples I could use as to something as simple as buying a new vehicle. Well, what are you saying, preacher? It's not God's will that I buy. I don't know whether it's God's will for you to buy a new vehicle or not. That's between you and Jesus. But many times people have a desire to do something and they've already made up their mind that they're going to do it. And, and I had somebody, a pastor once that told me that, man, I felt like I felt convicted after I bought the car. And I said, well, you'll know whether for sure you missed him or not. You, you felt convicted, so you probably shouldn't have done it. But you'll know whether you missed him for sure later on, especially if you start having trouble with your finances. You know, because a lot of times people just make decisions to serve their own desires and their own will, their own wants, right? And then, it, then they start getting in their emotions. I mean, Solomon said they get in their feels. Because it, it starts affecting our emotions whenever the decisions that we make 
affect us negatively. We didn't ask the Lord. See, whereas if we get along with the Lord and we hear his voice on it and we know that that was his will, when we make that decision, we might even make the decision knowing, you know what, this may have repercussions, but you know what, I've got the heart of the Lord on this. And, and I'm going to trust him through. Amen. Does that, does that make sense? And that's what we're supposed to do as believers. Why? Because you're not your own. People don't like that kind of stuff. I mean, I know y'all are cool with it, but a lot of people don't like What you talking about? No, you were bought with a price. You do not belong to yourself. When you said yes to Jesus as Lord, whether you realized it or not, you said, I belong to you now. That's what the Bible says. Whether or not we've gotten into the word of God and read that or not, that's, that's on us. But I'm just trying to make a point. I'm, I'm telling I've read it. And I know for a fact it says that. So I didn't want to go ahead and release that information out there to you. Newsflash. The scripture says that if you're born again, you're no longer your own. That's right. Amen. You've been bought with a price. Amen. The precious blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Amen? All right. And so, <laughs> so that's the soul. And then, and then here's the flesh. And I put this word down here. Members. Because, again, the members of the body parts. And so when we go back to the passage, it says that while we were living in the flesh. Now, I want to show you something. Can you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 for me? It seems like the word flesh is being used by the Apostle Paul. That's important. I'm just telling you for Bible study purposes. When the same writer writes something similar in more than one spot then it, mean, it really does mean something because, see, the Holy Spirit was using his heart and his mind and the information he had in there. It's not the same as automatic writing. I'm not getting into all that. The Holy Spirit used the heart and the mind of the man. So if Paul uses the same word flesh, but he kind of there's a little nuance to it, then we need to understand that, that he... Uh, okay, that he is trying to explain to us something here. So in Romans 7, I believe that he's talking about our life before Christ. He said, when we were in the flesh, okay, and then, he, and then later he goes into, I was alive once, and so he's explaining, but when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, right, that were being produced in our life and were operating in our members were bringing forth fruit to death. So he's saying before Christ, then our sinful, our sinful passions were alive and they were being acted out through our flesh in our members, right? Well, but look what he says right here. Now, this is the letter to the Corinthian church and he's speaking to Christians. Because, I mean, look how he addresses them. He says, but I, brothers, he's calling them brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh and as infants in Christ. Same Greek word. Okay, as a matter of fact, I think it's verse 10. Can you go to Romans chapter 7, verse 10 real quick? I think it's 10. Uh, Romans 7, 10. No, that's not it. I'm going to have to look. But it's Romans 7. We'll find it real quick. It's the same word. All right, I'm not going to make you wait. I thought it was I thought it was in 10, but it wasn't. Is it 14, maybe? Is it this? I don't know. I'm looking for the word. Yes, that word carnal. Thank you. For we know that the law, I'm in the Strong's in mind, but yeah, so in the ESV, it's probably flesh, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. So what he's saying here is, is that the law is not the problem. It's a spiritual thing. The law is a spiritual thing. But the flesh is carnal. And, and, and again, in the Corinthian letter, what he said was that the flesh was, he was saying that it was a problem in the lives of believers. Right? And, and the scripture says those that are the sons of God are those that are led by the spirit and not the flesh. So a true son of God is not going to be led by his flesh. He's led by the Spirit of God. Amen. And the Spirit of God desires to lead us and to guide us. But there are the, there is the possibility that believers are, instead of being led by the Spirit, are still being led by their flesh. And they're still allowing themselves to do what they want instead of what God wants. And it's causing conflict in their spiritual walk. And, and it causes an upheaval and it causes frustration. And then the next thing you know, we begin to see the lusts of the flesh produced instead of the fruit of the spirit, right? 
The lust of the flesh are like a lot of things, but some of them are division and envy and jealousy and drunkenness and fornication, you know, all these kinds of things. Uh, anger, wrath, right? And, and it's, not, it's not godly anger. It's, it's, it's fleshly anger. And, and, God's, and, it, and it's not, you know, it's not the will of God that we operate that way. Okay, so I wanted, I wanted you to see that because I wanted you to, to really ask the question, have you ever been in a place as a Christian where your love for God is encouraging you to be pleasing to him, but there are things in your life that you know he's not pleased with? And those things are becoming frustrating to you, so you want them gone, but you don't know how to get rid of them. So again, in Romans 7, Paul is speaking to Christians who have not yet learned to walk in the Spirit and are attempting to live Christianity in their flesh. Now, I want to say this, and, and, and they're, trying to, they're trying to live a performance-based Christianity instead of a faith in Christ's performance that releases grace and a flow of the Holy Spirit. See, sin is a spiritual problem that requires a spiritual solution. The spiritual solution to the problem of sin is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves in the life and the heart of believers because of what Jesus did on the cross. Your faith in that allows you to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus and allows the Holy Spirit to move on your behalf. He will begin to set you free of things that you could never set yourself free from. No Christian counselor is going to get rid of it. No medicine is going to get rid of it. I'm just, I'm not coming against Christian counselors. I'm not coming against medicine. I'm not even going to come against 12-step programs right now. I'm just trying to make a point. Ain't none of them things going to be able to set you free on the interior of who you are. It's only Jesus, what he did, and it's the grace of the Holy Spirit, amen, moving in that situation. And listen, you got to fight the good fight of faith, brothers and sisters. You can't give up halfway through the journey and throw your hand. Now, you can give up in your on yourself. That's what happened to me that night after that barroom experience. I woke up the next morning, and I didn't even know this was going to happen. It was like I said, Lord... I can't do it. You have to do it. And boom! I didn't even understand none of this stuff. Something shifted in the spirit realm. And it was like, it was different. Yeah. It was a surrender. <laughs> it was a recognition that I could not do it. Yes. And listen, I want to tell you something. You can know all this stuff about the message of the cross. You can Romans 6. You can Romans 5. You can Romans 7. You can Romans 8. We know all these things. And we can quote these scriptures. And we can, we can be like a doctor of the law with the, with the message of the cross. And regurgitate it. But guess what? Just because we can regurgitate it, just because we know it here, doesn't mean that it's had its effect right here, my friend. And we're going to get into that in a little bit because, see, what the message of the, the truth of the gospel is supposed to do is to deal with us at the level of the heart. Amen. It's supposed to, it's supposed to deal with our heart. And again, this is the issue that so many of us, no, not just so many of us, all believe, all human beings have heart problems. We got, a, we got a heart condition. Amen? Amen. And, and we need the Lord to do the work. And no, I don't care if you've been saved 25 years, 30 years. It doesn't matter. That is the problem. It's a heart condition. Right. <laughs> and look, sometimes we can't see it. Amen. Sometimes we can't see our own heart. Because certain sins make it harder to see our own. I was sitting down talking with somebody. I went to a pastor's luncheon today. If I said his name, y'all wouldn't know him. I just happened to, he was right there and I sat by him. And he said, you know, for the person that's got a problem with alcohol or the person that's got tracks on their arm, they pretty much know they got a problem. Yeah. But for sometimes people with self-righteousness and pride, that's what the Pharisees were infected by, my yes. friend. And they sure enough thought they were right. And there was even times when they, they realized maybe they weren't right, but they, but, but they didn't have a heart change. I mean, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, hallelujah. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that 
people that are the worst of sinners that it's affecting their lives and wreaking havoc in their lives. Many times they know they have a problem, but it's the people that feel like they got some stuff together and they feel like they know some things and they don't even realize it, but they got a self-righteous religious spirit, a critical spirit, whatever, whatever. And Lord knows I've been there. You can't, you don't even realize that you yourself have a heart problem. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about is the heart for a little bit. Romans chapter six, verse 14 says this, though, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Praise God. You know, that word dominion means lordship. The scripture is saying that sin should not be your Lord. He's not. Sin is not your master. Jesus is your master. Jesus is your Lord. He purchased you. Sin has no power and control over your life. That's the word of God. And so if we find ourselves in positions and places where we feel like sin does have mastery over us, we're not, something's not right. Something's not working right. We need to readjust our faith and we need to put it back on the Lord. Amen. Amen. Or put it back on God's way of doing things. And this is good news for us because we're told that we no longer have to live under this dominion, right? But we can be free. I want you to know this, not only in the members of our flesh, but in the vestiges of the fall that want to hide and linger in our soul. When it comes to the, listen, I want to just make this point, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about demons anymore in this message, but I, I have come to the conclusion that whenever people do have demons, I do believe that they hide. I believe that. I believe they're masters at hide. But I want to say this, okay? Done with the demon talk. Flesh. The details in the darkness of our heart, the vestiges of the fall that cling that are in us. Because you see, in the book of James, it says, when a man is tempted, let him not say he's tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt any man with evil. Yet each man is drawn away because of what? The lusts that are in his own heart. So until we're allowing the Holy Spirit to deal with our heart, we need not look any further is what I'm trying to say. We still got a whole lot of work to let the Holy Ghost do on the inside of us. Let's start with Pastor Matt because he's the one standing behind the pulpit. Start with me, Lord. Do something in me. Produce the image of Jesus in me. Make me look more like your son. Put his heart on the inside of me. I don't even know exactly what that means to pray that prayer. And the Lord's like, you sure you want it? I'm like, I ain't got no choice, Lord. I've got to have it because if, that's, if I don't have the heart of Jesus, I don't even want to do this anymore. I'm just going to be honest with you. If I don't have his heart beating in me, I don't want to be a faker. I don't want to be a poser. I want the real thing. Amen. And he's got to start by doing something in, in us. Amen. Amen. Our mind and our will and our emotions can be given over to God. See, I want you to see that. See, our mind and our will and our emotions can get in the way of God. But our mind, our will, and our emotions can be given over to God. Yeah. Now we're not only saved in our spirit, hallelujah, but our mind is thinking about Jesus. Our wants are all about Jesus and his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then my emotions, oh Lord, I just love you so much. You know, I want to say this about the heart too. The reason I drew the heart on this line between the soul and the spirit is because the way I'm seeing it when I when I study this out, the scripture will it will te teach you that the heart is part of the soul. But there's so many scriptures that describe the heart being filled with the things of God. And it's also describes that not only is it part of the soul connected to the mind, but that it's like a fountain that issues forth whatever's in there. Okay, you know, we talked about that last week, right? When we talked about the words, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So, so let, let's, let's get clear on that. I mean, I don't mean to preach that over again, but let us understand that's fruit talk, that's symptom talk. If you just stopped and started recording yourself and what you're saying in your conversations with other human beings and you played it back, then it might give you a clue of, of what's in your heart. 
You might hear yourself talking to somebody and all you're doing is talking about Jesus 65% of the time. And then you'll hear 35% of the time some stuff that wasn't Jesus. Some gossip, some malice, some slander, some, I don't know, some something. You, you know what I mean? Okay, but what I want you to know is this, is that I see, I see the heart as being a bridge between the spirit and the soul and that the spirit moving and, and that now the things of God are settling also into the heart and it becomes a fountain. That with your lips you glorify God, with your mind, your mind is stayed upon Christ. Amen. Your, emo your, your, your emotions are not only stabilized for your own personal life, but they're just full of joy and gladness to give to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Does that make sense? It's like a, it's like the Holy Spirit uses the, and, and he's putting all that into our heart. And it's like a bridge between and it's starting to affect our mind, our will and our emotions. OK, the things of God. Our mind and, and all of these things can be can be handy. And the way that this happens is that part of the way this happens is that we hand him the pruning shears. <laughs> We hand the Holy Ghost the pruning shears. We hand him the scalpel for the circumcision of the heart. We hand him the bellows. You know what a bellow is? We used to have one at the house when we moved to Singapore. Mom bought one. Well, what is this? It's you stoke the flame with it, Matthew. Right? We didn't even have a fireplace over there. It was like subtropic. But anyway, we had one. And I used to play with it as a kid. And it'd blow air. <laughs> See, that the refiner uses a bellow to put oxygen into the flame to stoke the flame. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that in order for this process to take place where the love that is in the spirit that is made way one with the Lord for it to enter into our mind, our will and our emotions. We got to say, here you go, Lord. Here's the pruning shears. I trust you. Here you go, Lord. Here's the scalpel. I trust you to do the surgeon's work. Here you go, Lord. Here's the bellows. Make the flame hotter. Mm -hmm. So that the flame can burn out the impurity. Yes. So that the pruning yes. can, can begin. Amen. So that those branches that are still in the glory of God, right? I don't know nothing about too much about horticulture, but I heard somebody talk about it one time. You gotta cut off them sucker branches because they're trying to steal the nourishment so in a way so that the fruit won't be exposed. Yes. See, that's part of the vestiges of the flesh that's hiding way down deep on the inside of who we are. The Lord wants to pull that stuff up. But it goes back to 2 Corinthians 13, the last verse, when it says to coin and Nia with the Holy Spirit. Join, participate with the Holy Spirit. Let him have his way in our heart and in our lives. Amen. You know, in the, the word of God, I just want you to know that sin is still a problem in the lives of believers. Some people are like, man, you know, you talk so much about sin. OK, but sin is still a problem in the life of the believer. Now, the God does not want that to be our normal relationship. You understand it. it he teaches us in Romans Six, that the relationship between the sinful nature and the believer has been severed. That's what the word of God says. That did you not know that those of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. And even as he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. So he's saying that we died in Christ and that a new creation has been resurrected. And so that's the truth of the word. But again, we can know something intellectually, but yet it hasn't happened yet in our heart. Amen. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to go from point A to point B where we're allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way. And I'm trying to really explain these things to you because I believe that it's very important for our growth as Christians to where, because see, look, what did Paul say? How I travail until Christ be formed in you. That is the will of God, that the image of the Lord be formed in us yes. that we that us the old man quits coming out and that Jesus starts coming out. hallelujah that's good that's good preaching right yes. there you know uh, I mean somebody might have been able to articulate it better but what I just told you was good yes. that 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 the Lord desires to do that and if we'll work with him and yield to him 
He will, he'll do the work in us. Amen. And we're going to start looking more like Jesus. Amen. I, I know that's what you want. That's got, that, that's, listen, even if you don't think that's what you want, trust me, that's what you want. Amen. Amen. That's what you want. Because that's what you're going to hear. See, the more we look like the beloved, the better the chances that we're going to hear well done, beloved. <laughs> right? Amen. All right. I wanted to just show you a couple of things. Because, and I wanted to say this too, that the word sin it means simply to miss the mark. So what I do want you to know is that the, that the mark is Jesus. Amen. To miss or wander from the path of uprightness and honor to do or go wrong. So it's to, it's to miss the mark that is Jesus. So that means that when you, when you say something that Jesus wouldn't have said, you miss the mark. When you had a feeling in your heart, and we're about to get into this in a second. When you had a feeling in your heart that was different than the, what the Lord would have felt, you missed the mark. Okay? And, and, and a mature Christian, though, will begin to realize that before it issues out of his mouth or out of her mouth. You'll start to recognize how you feel in your spirit, in your inner man, and especially when you feel conflicted and frustrated. Look, I'm preaching to myself. When you, when you hear some kind of news and then all of a sudden, you know, you feel the growling going on on the inside. That's supposed to, and what we're really supposed to do is get along with the Lord. Amen. And I don't know why, but there's something in me. Oftentimes, I want to call somebody. Yeah. And I remember the, the old song, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Hallelujah. And, and he's really the one that we should be calling. So I'll preach it to the preacher. I'm, I'm, but I want to encourage all of you to know. That's really what we need to do. We need to go to the Lord. All right. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 15. And this is a long passage of scripture. So I'm just going to kind of start reading real quick. And we'll see. We're not going to get much further than this. But we're talking about the heart. We've already talked about the fact that the Lord has died to set us free. Amen. He's made us a new creation. We have access to grace. So look what it says. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. <laughs> now look at Jesus, man. Y'all can think what y'all want about our Lord, but look, look what he says. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God? Now I don't know if his voice sounded like that or not, but I'm just trying to make a point. They said to him, why do your disciples do this? And he said, why do you do this? That's exactly what the scripture says. They said one thing and he turned it around on them real quick. Hold on. Why are you? You want to know why they're doing this? Let's ask you a question. Why do you do this? Right? Because he knew their heart. All right. So he says, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Okay. He said, verse three, he answered them. Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah say of you when he said. Now this is serious. So what is Jesus really saying here? He's, he, 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 listen, and look, I'm going to be honest with you. I definitely, I believe that there's more going on in the story. I believe the Pharisees were very wicked in their heart. They're very covetous. And they're actually telling the people, you can bring, you don't have to worry about your mom and your daddy. Even though the law said that, that's the heart of God for, for the child to take care. He said, you don't have to worry about that. Because see, if you say that the gift you're given came to the temple, you're exonerated. You're free. You don't have to worry about that other law. We made a new law that says if you bring this to the gift, you can tell your parents whatever I was going to give you. See, and now you're, you're telling now something weird's happening in the people's hearts. And they're, now they're probably claiming things that they never even gave to the temple telling their parents. And you know what I'm saying? I'm taking some speculation here, but what I'm trying to say is, is that something is going on. And then in addition to that, why did the Pharisees make that rule? Did they have access to some of the gifts that were getting there? We already know Jesus done turned the tables over because the tradition says that they were selling three-legged lambs or lambs with broken legs and whatever the case, and that they were extorting the people. And it, and it says it in the scripture. It says your tradition, you may void the word of God, you hypocrites. Look at this. Isaiah said this, this people, verse 8, honors me with their lips, 
but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And then he goes on to say this in verse 10. He says, he called the people to him and he said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes into a mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of his mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? <laughs> the people get offended, right? When the truth hits them. He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. That reminds me of the parable of the tares, right? right? The Lord's going to take, take care of that in the end. He said, let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you so also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? The NLT version says goes into the sewer. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with one washed hands does not defile anyone. So he's saying that he's showing us that these things are in the heart of man. And that, and that sometimes if we would stop and listen to ourselves, we might see what's really in our heart. And that would be a clue that we need the Lord to do some surgery. Here's the scalpel. Yes, sir. Here you go. Pruning shears. Yes, sir. Here you go. Bellows to heat up. Yes, sir. Here you go. And I'm going to work with you and I'm going to yield to you and I'm going to lower myself. All right, real quick. Because it's kind of already late. So look at Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 through 13. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So not only will your words tell on you, but also the word of God will tell on you. You put your eyes on the word of God, you get into the word of God, and next thing you know, it's acting like a mirror to your soul. It's revealing to you your thoughts, your intents, and the word means deliberation, your motives, your mindset, your, how you're working this all out in your head. And, you know, I put it, I, I ended up getting, putting a lot of scripture, but we're not going to be able to go through it after that because it was talking about the heart. And I was just thinking, man, the heart is so powerful, right? The Lord said in, in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Yes. Listen, it is so important that we let God look x-ray our heart. It, I'm, I'm telling you, this, this word, his word is so important. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. There was there was many other scriptures, but look, look at look at I'm just gonna read this. John 14, 21. Well, this is what he says. Matthew 22, 37. Jesus said unto him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What I'm trying to say is, is that something else the Lord's been putting on my heart for quite some time. And I said it in Bible study the other night. Somehow, someway, justification and fear of the Lord, reverence of the presence of the Lord, reverence for the word of God needs to come together and get a good marriage going. <laughs> This, look at this, John 14 and 24. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. I just got to share my heart with you guys and tell you that God has been sobering me so much regarding the word of God and the fact that I feel like in my own life at times, 
I have conveniently ignored what the word is saying. And I feel like what the Holy Spirit is saying to me is that I am not the only one that has been guilty of this and that he wants me to bring it to the attention of anyone that has ears and is willing to hear. If people have died for this word, this word is written and he is very, very serious about what he has written. And if we're walking around thinking that because we're justified, but yet the evidence with the word connected to our heart is not lining up or the evidence of the words coming out of our mouth is not lining up Houston we have a problem and we need to let the Lord deal with us because we don't we want to let God deal with us on this side I'm just being real with you. Oh, what you trying to say? I'm not saying, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not here to tell you who's saved tonight and who's not. If you have believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, you're a child of God. I'm just trying to say we better line up with the Word of God. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm going I'm to close out with this. John, 4, John 12, 47 through 50. Look at this, man. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. I was thinking, man, that's what a lot of people in the church and in the world. Would. That's right. Don't judge me, preacher. Jesus ain't even going to judge me. Hold on a second. Slow down. Jesus is the judge. He is coming back on a white horse. He is coming back to judge. Okay, but this is what he's saying. Look what he says. I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. You know how we've looked at that in the past? We've looked at that like... Jesus is saying, oh, you rejected the fact that I said I was the son of God and you didn't accept me as your Lord and Savior. Hold on a second. He said, no. A matter of fact, last week when we talked about words, he said, by your word, you will be justified and by your word, you will be condemned out of the heart issues forth. Out of the mouth comes forth the issues of the heart. So what, he, what he's trying to tell us there is this, is that if you're speaking something that's contrary to this, you really need to take a look at yourself and make sure that you're really justified. Because if, because, because if it's not lining up, something may, is, it may not be right. And I mean, I'm just trying to say his word is serious. Does everybody agree with that? Hallelujah. Yes. All right. He says, the one who rejects me does not receive my words has a judge. Oh, man, this is. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me has himself given me a command. What to say, what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the father has told me. We're just going to pray to you. Father, we just give you glory and honor. We thank you, we praise you, we exalt you. Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Lord, let your word settle into our hearts tonight, oh Lord. Give us a newfound love for your word. Let it speak to us. Let it do its work of conviction. Holy Spirit, we joint participate with you and we give you the pruning shears and the scalpel. We give you the bellows. We ask you, Lord, as painful as it may be, we need you on this side of before we cross over that spiritual Jordan. Lord, we need you to deal with our hearts now. Lord, Lord we desire to live for you. We've given our heart to you. You purchased us with your blood. We understand that we're not our own. We understand that we belong to you, Lord. And we want we want to be pleasing to you. We understand that the only way that that can happen is if we're crucified and Christ is formed in us. Holy Spirit, form Jesus in us. He is the express image of you, your holiness. Form him in us, O oh Lord. Make us more aware of the words we speak. Give us a newfound hunger and a love and a desire for your word. Lord, and that when we read it, listen to it, however we can put it in us, that, Lord, it would speak to us and it would bring conviction, a healthy conviction. Lord, help justification and the fear of God. Because that's one of the scriptures I was going to read. 1 Peter 1.18. During your sojourning here on earth, walk it out with fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with the corruptible things, but the precious blood of the Lamb. 
Lord. We owe you that, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Lord, we owe you that, Lord, to walk in reverence to you, to your word. Have your way in our hearts and lives. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.